Next on PIJN News, Dr. Chaps reports on these important issues. Today is part two of two in our special teaching series on how to be an activist. Did you know you can change laws? You don't even need to be an elected official. We're gonna teach you all the tools you need. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt, Dr. Chaps, and you're watching PIJN News. Today we have part two of two in our special teaching series on political activism. How to change the law, even if you're just a common citizen. We are going to give you tools, and in a previous show, we explained to you this, the eight tools that I'm about to list here very quickly, but in particular, I want you to think of yourself as ruling your community. We live in a wonderful, land where our founding fathers designed a system where the people can rule the government. Even if you're not an elected official, and there are four different kinds of people, right? There's elected officials who vote and change laws and they represent us. There's Congress, the president, the courts, and those are important people and we need to pray for them. But then there's also the people who petition them using our first amendment right to petition the government for redress of wrongs. The people are often informed by the media and you can become a part of the media. That's why we have this TV show. I'm just a guy, but we have a TV show and we're, we've are we become the media. If you have a social networking platform, Facebook, Twitter, an email list, a fax list, whatever you have, you can build an army of people. All you gotta do is have a vision of what you want changed. So if you can picture, now the fourth group is of course the activist. You are the activist and you can change the laws by mobilizing people, to petition their congressman and it can happen. Here are those eight tools. Let me just list them very quickly. First, you gotta have a vision of the injustice that you want changed. Then you've gotta build an army of people that includes your email list, right? List of all your friends, your fax list. Can you fax and mobilize congressmen? We recommend that you use faxcongress.com. It's a free service, faxcongress.com. And communicate with your church, your pastors. Mobilize your army of people to sign those petitions. You need to learn how to write a press release or to give interviews to the media. I've given over 500 separate radio interviews over the years. Also a petition gathering device. If you can collect a group of people to write petitions, gather them together, present them to the decision makers, or even just pray. You know, God is the ultimate decision maker. And if we get a lot of people praying, God will rule on our behalf and correct the injustice we face in this life. What about civil disobedience? We all remember Rosa Parks, right? Wouldn't sit in the back of the bus. Well, what, did that, what good did that do? She's just one person. No, she led a movement that changed national law, the 19 civil, 1964 Civil Rights Act. She led rallies and Dr. Martin Luther King, we have read, led rallies. We're gonna t explain some of those rallies to you and how we have helped change bad laws or policies in 13 states. You know, another tool is to file lawsuits. And if you have a pro bono Christian attorney, we recommend working with Alliance Defending Freedom or the Rutherford Institute or Liberty Institute. There's so many Christian law firms now that you can become an activist just by demanding redress in a court or lobbying decision makers. Go to Capitol Hill, meet with your congressman, go to your state capitol, meet with your elected senators and state representatives you can change the law just by having relationships with those people. And finally, run for office. I'm part of a team now working with some mobilizers who are trying to recruit a thousand pastors to run for office across America, to replace the evildoers, and maybe God is calling you to run for office someday. Well, maybe not yet. First, we're gonna sharpen your skills by teaching you how to become a political activist. Now. I'm a Christian conservative constitutionalist, but we can learn by studying our enemies, right? Political adversaries of religious liberty, people who hate religious liberty, we should study their techniques, not to do exactly what they do, but to find out what are the arguments they make so we can make the opposite arguments. Here are 
four examples of anti-Christian groups that go around the country and sue people to stop people from praying in Jesus' name. But I, as a Christian activist, have opposed these groups. For example, Sue Herman was the president of the ACLU, what we call the Anti-Christian Liberties Union. Here's another complainer, Barry Lynn, with Americans United for the Abolition of the Church with the State Sword. Americans United, he calls himself. Annie Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Of course, the Constitution doesn't say that. It says freedom of religion, not from religion. And of course, everyone's favorite anti-Christian complainer, Mikey Weinstein with the Militant Religion Foes Foundation. These four groups of people go around the country filing lawsuits. That is pretty much their only tool because they cannot mobilize crowds of people. Most Americans are Christians. So if, they were to, if any of these four were to try and win an election, I think they would lose. So instead what they do is they appeal to liberal judges to rewrite the laws without popular support. And they do so claiming to defend the Constitution when actually they're domestic enemies of the Constitution. Here, for example, is a map of lawsuits. I think this has been compiled by Alliance Defending Freedom. Lawsuits around the country, every red dot or blue dot represents an anti-Christian lawsuit filed by some of these complainers who are literally trying to stop people from praying in Jesus' name in public? They wanna silence Christians from exercising our free speech rights? Well, that's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, I'm gonna go through at least 11, maybe 13 different examples of victories that we've scored by using these eight activist tools around the country. Giving you a megaphone in Washington, D.C. Dr. Chaps will be right back do you care about defending religious liberty? I know you do. And that's why I'm asking you to take action today. Don't just sit there, but do something. Visit our website, PrayInJesusName.org and sign a petition that we will fax to Congress on your behalf. In fact, there are three specific petitions I want you to sign to defend military chaplains who are under fire. The first is to support H.R. 343. This is a bill introduced in Congress by my friend, Congressman Walter Jones of North Carolina, to protect free speech for military chaplains who are sometimes punished if they use the word Jesus in their prayers. Well, if you know my story, you know that I was punished in 2006, uh, even at court martial, because I used the word Jesus in my prayers in uniform in front of the White House. Well, I was later vindicated by Congress who said it's okay for me to do that. But did you know 65 other chaplains are now suing the Navy? I was not the only person. Our second petition I want you to sign is to protect military chapel buildings, which are being desecrated. Christian altars, Catholic or Protestant, are being desecrated by homosexual wedding ceremonies in all 50 states under this order by the Obama administration. Well, that deprives all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines of a sacred worship space, which ought to be protected. And instead, they're gonna punish the chaplain if he won't turn over the keys to his chapel. Here's another petition I want you to sign, and this is to stop threatening court-martial for troops who talk about Jesus. Even recently, the Pentagon is saying, oh, we're gonna threaten you with a crime of proselytizing. No, that's not right. Any soldier ought to be able to talk about his or her faith in Jesus Christ and to have that same religious freedom of speech that we sacrifice to give for others. When you sign these petitions, we will fax them to Congress, and it's free. I want you to take action today. Sign these three important petitions at PrayInJesusName.org. Go there today. He is the intersection of church and state. Here is Dr. Chaps. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Chaps. I'm gonna tell you a series of stories now, true stories of our past 10 years in Christian activism and how we have helped change bad laws or policies in 13 states to restore freedom to pray in Jesus' name, beginning in Florida. Here's a picture of my friend, hospital chaplain Danny Harvey, who dared to pray in Jesus' name with his hospital patients and at public meetings. He was warned by his HR director, you've gotta stop praying in Jesus' name because you're offending people. He said, no, I'm gonna take a stand. In fact, he believed the Bible in Colossians 3. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So he refused to water down his prayers and he was fired the next day. Well, we took action. When I heard about his story in the newspaper, I flew to Florida and we organized a rally. 
There were 30 churches who marched with Chaplain Harvey. Here he is in a picture of all of us wearing white t-shirts that say, my Jesus, my stand. 1,200 citizens on a Saturday morning rallied together and marched around the hospital in single file that had fired the chaplain and the CEO of the hospital resigned in the face of public scandal. The hospital apologized. The re they ran a full page ad saying they would let chaplains pray in Jesus name. They changed their policy and we won. Unfortunately, Chaplain Harvey never did get his job back. He's a Christian hero who sacrificed everything to take a stand for religious freedom and we give him high marks for being a political activist. Here's our second example. In Indiana, in 2007, there was a bad judge in the case of Hendricks versus Bosma. And this is a picture of that judge. David Hamilton ruled in the case of Hendricks versus Bosma that it's illegal to pray in Jesus' name on the floor of the Indiana State House. You can pray to Allah because that's non-sectarian. But if you pray in Jesus' name, that's too sectarian and that's banned by his twisted reading of the First Amendment. Are you kidding me? Well, I took action. I work with my attorneys at the Rutherford Institute. We filed legal briefings with the Indiana Attorney General who appealed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and we won a two to one reversal. And now people in Indiana are free again to pray in Jesus name. By the way, this Judge Hamilton was later promoted to the appeals court, which had overruled him, but we sent 700,000 faxes against his nomination, mobilizing the people to stand up against that evildoer. Here's our third example is in Ohio, where the Speaker of the House, John Husted, who was a Republican, was afraid of a Democrat protest when Chris Redfern, the ranking Democrat leader, walked out in protest because a visiting pastor dared to pray in Jesus' name. So what did the speaker do? He caved in, he was afraid, and he banned his pastors from praying in Jesus' name on the floor of the Ohio State House. So I'm just a guy, I'm watching this, I read about it in the newspapers, what did I do? I took action. I flew to Ohio, I organized rallies, I preached in 17 churches in 12 days, and we flooded the Ohio State House of Representatives with people's telephone calls. People from all over the state called the speaker, and when he came back, he repented. His first action as resuming, when, when, the, when he gaveled in the next session, was to restore freedom for pastors to pray in Jesus' name, and we won. Just by mobilizing the people to make those phone calls, to petition their elected officials, you can change the law and we change that bad policy in Ohio. Here's our fourth example, in Oklahoma. Even in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I mean, this is like one of the most Christian cities in America, right? Well, they had an old policy, 20 years it had never been enforced, that pastors are supposed to pray non-sectarian prayers if they come and give a prayer before the city council meeting. Well, one day, an anti-Christian complainer said they got to stop doing that and they began to enforce the policy. They told the pastors, we'll allow you to come and pray in the normal rotation unless you pray in Jesus' name. Then you will not be scheduled to return. So guess what I did? I flew to Oklahoma. We organized pastors there and we sent out email alerts and news alerts to the good people of Oklahoma. The pastors got involved and they flooded the city council meeting with protesters. And that same night, here's a picture of uh, my name on the front page of the Tulsa World newspaper that week. And the city council voted 7-2 to reverse the ban and restore freedom to pray in Jesus' name. We won in Oklahoma. Well, here's another example in Pennsylvania, right? I think this is number five now, I'm starting to lose count. Here is a picture of two men in Pennsylvania that ended up at loggerheads and they disagreed about a particular policy. Here's the Democrat Speaker of the Pennsylvania State House, Keith McCall, I think this is in 2008, who had invited this pastor on the right, Jerry Stoltzfus, to come and pray before the Pennsylvania State House of Representatives. He was gonna give the opening prayer. And of course, the Speaker, being a Democrat and being a little bit afraid of controversy, he wanted to screen the prayer ahead of time Pastor submitted a copy of the prayer, but it ended in Jesus' name. So the speaker said, no, you cannot come and say the prayer. Well, the pastor went to the newspapers. It blew up. And when I read this, I took action. As an activist, 
I purchased some rented email lists of hundreds of thousands of people who live in Pennsylvania, and we got them to sign petitions. When they signed those petitions, we operated the fax machines. We delivered over 100,000 faxes to the 250 members of the Pennsylvania House and Senate. When they came into their, their office the next morning, their floors were literally covered with paper, fax paper of Pennsylvania citizens demanding this pastor's right to pray in Jesus' name. And guess what? We won. They had a private meeting with the speaker. He repented, he reversed his bad policy, and he invited the pastor to come and pray in Jesus' name. But you know what the pastor did? He had a little bit of backbone. He said, no thanks. I'd rather go pray in Jesus' name on the floor of the Pennsylvania Senate. And that's exactly what he did. So we won in Pennsylvania just by mobilizing the people. Here's another story. Uh, state number six is Oregon. And in Baker City, Oregon, even on the left, co left coast, there are pastors and people who want to pray in Jesus' name. But when there was an anti-Christian complainer at the city council, the city council said, no, no, we're gonna ban pastors from praying in Jesus' name. So I took action. This time I did not fly to Oregon, but I just used the telephone. And I called about a dozen evangelical pastors in that city. I told them where and when the city council meeting was gonna be, and they flooded that city council meeting with their parishioners. People, like 300 people, they'd never seen this many com people come to a city council meeting, and they voted five to zero to reverse the ban and restore freedom to pray in Jesus' name. You know, just by showing up at the city council meeting, bring all your friends, you can make a difference and you can change a law. Let me tell you now about California. This is one of my favorite stories. And we talked at the beginning of the show about these anti-Christian complainers, right? They file lawsuits and they threaten city councils and the atheists are very good in the courts sometimes. And they threatened, in this case, the mayor of Lodi, California. If you've ever been to Lodi, California, you may have seen, when you're driving through, I think it's Highway 99, you may have met this man, Larry Hansen, who was then the mayor of California, I think this is in 2009, and he was afraid of an anti-Christian lawsuit, so he banned the pastors from using the word Jesus in their public prayers. If you're gonna give an invocation at the city council meeting, you cannot pray in Jesus' name according to the mayor. So guess what I did when I found out up at this? I took action. As an activist, as a private citizen, I don't even live in California, but I flew to California and we organized a rally. Building up my email list over time, we flooded them with petitions and we organized 400 citizens to attend a prayer rally on the steps of the city council meeting. Here is a picture of me with the, I'm standing right by the flag there. You can almost see me at the bottom in the crowd. And we organized, they had never seen this many people come to a city council meeting demanding the right to pray in Jesus' name. But the mayor would not repent. So we sent in some pastors, about a dozen of the local pastors, people who knew this man and, and had worked with him over the years. But the mayor would not repent when they asked for the freedom to pray in Jesus' name. So finally, as an activist, I took a bold stand and I, I actually threatened them a little bit that I was gonna buy billboards on the side of the highway. And I was gonna list the names of all the city council members who voted against Jesus, including the mayor. Guess what? The mayor repented. He reversed the policy and the city council voted five to zero to restore freedom to pray in Jesus' name. We won in California. You know what? Those atheist complainers never did file a lawsuit. It was an empty threat. So. Our next story, I think this is number seven, is in North Carolina, where my friend on the right, Pastor Ron Beatty, was a visiting chaplain to the California State House, and he was informed by this Democrat speaker on the left, Joe Hackney, that you can pray in Jesus' name, but it's gonna be your last time you're fired after this. In fact, Pastor Ron Beatty was fired because he prayed in Jesus' name. So guess what I did? We organized all the fax numbers of all the North Carolina state legislators and we buried them in petitions. We organized a petition, people signed it online, we turned it into a fax, we sent it to hundreds of state representatives and senators in California, and North, sorry, North Carolina, and they repented. And their first act of business after the new elections was to pray in Jesus' name. Here's another story in Virginia. 
This, was, this represents three years of my life fighting this battle in Virginia. As an activist, there was an observation that I made, and I happened to be living in Virginia at the time after I got out of the Navy, that the police chaplains were under fire. There were 17 state trooper chaplains who worked for the governor, and they were ordered by the superintendent of police to stop praying in Jesus' name. He called them all into a meeting, said you have to pray non-sectarian prayers. Six of those chaplains resigned rather than deny Christ. They were heroes who took a stand for their freedom to pray in Jesus' name, even willing to give up their jobs as chaplains. Well, when I heard about this, that these men were so courageous that they'd be willing to give up their career just for their freedom to pray in Jesus' name, I stood with them. The first thing I did was write a letter to the governor of Virginia. At that time, it was Tim Kaine, a Democrat, and he wrote back to me a three-page letter. By the way, my letter was signed by 86 pastors with American Family Association, and all of these 86 pastors plus me petitioned the governor. He wrote me a three-page letter, and Governor Tim Kaine wrote to me and said, I'm not gonna change my policy. We're not gonna let the chaplains pray in Jesus' name. And he went on television saying, when I pray to God or the Lord, I can do that without mentioning Jesus. So all my chaplains have to water down their prayers too, essentially. Well, that wasn't good enough for me. So we organized a rally outside of the Virginia governor's mansion. Here's me standing beside Matt Staver and 1,000 Christians who marched on the Virginia governor's mansion in a rally. We took out radio ads, we got a crowd to show up, and the governor still would not repent. So we organized with some of the legislators, and by the way, two police chaplains, Rex Carter and Mike Honecker, both attended this rally with us, petitioned the crowd. There were legislators there who ran legislation. We got a bill passed through the Virginia State House to restore freedom to pray in Jesus' name, but it was blocked in the Virginia Senate by this man, Cray Deeds, was a senator in Virginia who did not want that legislation to pass, did not want the police chaplains praying in Jesus' name. Isn't it interesting that he was running for governor the next year? Against the man on the right, a Christian man who went to Regent University, Bob McDonnell, and I know he's had some trouble later in his career, but at this time, he was campaigning as a Christian Republican who would protect police chaplains' right to pray in Jesus' name. So we organized voting guides. We published voting guides with a list of all the pro-Jesus legislators, all the anti-Jesus legislators, the pro-Jesus candidate for governor, the anti-Jesus candidate for governor, and we faxed it to 2,700 Virginia churches. Those churches received our voting guides and they mobilized their citizens to vote. Pastors, if you're not organizing your people to show up and vote in the next election, you're falling down on the job. But these pastors, thankfully, organized. Before we had sent out those voter guides, the polls were just about even. Within the margin of error, I think it was 48 to 45. But after we sent out those voter guides and six weeks later they held the election, it was a landslide. 59% voted for the Christian to become governor. 41% voted for the anti-Jesus senator to become governor. And we won the election. Not only that, we fired six members of the Virginia State Assembly. So those delegates were fired. Then we presented to the new governor, Bob McDonnell, 14,000 paper petitions demanding his, his, that he keep his campaign promise, restore police chaplains' right to pray in Jesus' name, and he did. He changed the policy. The new governor changed the policy. Now all those state trooper chaplains are free again to pray in Jesus' name. The six chaplains who had lost their jobs were invited to come back. So here's another story from New York. We got involved briefly when these anti-Christian complainers threatened a lawsuit against Greece, New York. And here is the heroic supervisor, John Alberger, who took a stand and I sent him a fax. I said, Mr. Supervisor, you're being sued. You should hire these Christian lawyers with Alliance Defending Freedom because you're being sued by the anti-Christian lawyers with uh, Americans United. So he listened, he did hire those Christian lawyers and they appealed. He lost the first, well, how did it go? I think he won the first round, he lost the second round and then it went to the US Supreme Court. In May of 2014, in a five to four decision by the United States Supreme Court, they ruled that it's okay to pray in Jesus' name. 
Now in all 50 states, we have case law precedent. Thanks be to God, I discern the spirit of God on this town supervisor who took a stand for the right to pray in Jesus' name. Now we've also had victories in Hawaii that I don't have time to talk about. We've had victories in the US Congress that I don't have time to talk about. Here's the 13th victory that uh, I'm gonna explain to you for just a moment. Some of you know that in another life, I'm an elected official that uh, here I am in the Colorado State House of Representatives. And when I was there, I noticed they had a policy, even after the Supreme Court victory, that pastors should pray non-sectarian prayers. Don't pray in Jesus' name if you're gonna give the invocation in the Colorado State House. Well, I read this policy and I said, this is unconstitutional. And I went directly to the clerk and then to the speaker and, and we negotiated and I invited my pastor, Mel Waters of New Life Church, a man I've known for 20 years, to come and pray in Jesus' name. And because of the Supreme Court decision the previous months, now for the first time in a decade, we got prior written permission for my pastor, Mel Waters, to come and pray in Jesus' name on the floor of the Colorado State House of Representatives. We won again. And now we have religious liberty in Colorado. So those are my stories. I don't know if that was a fire hose, maybe it was too much for you to absorb all this time. Go back and watch this show over again. Learn what those eight tools of activism are. I'm just a guy, but I have helped change bad laws and you can do it too. You can be an activist. In fact, I wanna pray this special anointing on you right now, let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray your blessing on every person watching this program, that you will give them an activist anointing to take back their government, to defy and overturn injustice, to gather an army of people to collectively petition, not just the government, but to petition Almighty God in prayer. And God, we pray that you give us justice, that you pass this torch from me to every person watching, that they will stand up and participate in their elections, that they will run for office, that they will restore godly control of the United States government. Father, give them that anointing and give us that victory. I pray your blessing upon each of these activists in training. In Jesus' name, amen. Please call us at 866-Obey-God or visit PrayInJesusName.org. God bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time. Chaplain Klingenschmidt is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy who earned his Ph.D. in theology from Regent University. As a former Navy chaplain, by taking a public stand for freedom of speech and religious expression, and by sacrificing his own 16-year career and million-dollar pension, he was vindicated by the U.S. Congress, who changed the law and restored freedom for military chaplains to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps not only defended the Constitution, but his petitions have helped change the law in 10 states, restoring freedom to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.